Let's talk about some dominant paradigms or in something a little less highfalutin, ways of doing things in educational research. The behaviorist tradition, as this general list points out, equates learning with changes in observable performance. So, for example, a child's ability to correctly answer 5 times 8 with the correct answer of 48 would be an example, a very simple one, of learning that has taken place. Behaviorists are minded to believe that practice forms habits, uh, what they call a form of conditioning. So we have Pavlov's famous experiment with his dog or B.F. Skinner's experiment with pigeons in which these animals were taught new behaviours. Is this an example of learning? Behaviorism has often come under fire for this form of conditioning, which is often seen as tyrannical. But however, it can be used to train individuals quite well to acquire specific competences. To a much greater extent than social constructivist ways of doing things in educational research, content is emphasized. So an emphasis on skills such as understanding and mastery, analysis and evaluation, which are then applied in formative and summative assessment. Again, this is a very general list, but some examples of behaviorism in schools include an emphasis on producing observable and measurable outcomes in students, things that can be computed into raw data. And there's often an emphasis on the pre-assessment of students with baseline data to determine where teaching should start. So for example, accelerated reader star reading test. This, these are later then used for post-teaching assessments to determine progress and if further interventions should be used if students are below the stated standards. There's also an emphasis on mastering early steps before progressing to more complex tasks. So an emphasis on sequencing. And again, as we've seen, a use of reinforcement and routine with tangible rewards. This might be in the form of earlier break times, school trips, etc., etc. Social constructivism is a broad constellation, just like behaviorism to some extent. It's a set of theories that equate learning with creating meaning from experience. So we always construct something new or co-construct something new with our students in this paradigm. Social constructivists believe that the mind makes sense of stimulus or stimuli from the world by producing its own unique reality. Phenomenography emphasizes, for example, that students have their own conceptions of phenomena, which may be more or less qualitatively sophisticated than others, than the educators, for example. Students should be helped to integrate their learning in school with their experiences of the world. Learning a school subject often le involves learning how to think like a member of that disciplinary community, for example. And like behaviorists, there's an emphasis on sequence, moving from experience to theory. In contrast to behaviorists, though, social constructivists are a lot more inclined to see the situated nature of learning. That is, that each instructional or educational context cannot be entirely separated from the wider context of the classroom and the forces beyond the classroom itself. Compared to behaviorists, social constructivists are a lot more open-ended about their objectives in some cases. Jean Piaget, a Swiss psychologist, wrote and thought deeply throughout his life, but for our purposes, we'll only take two key ideas which he hands down to educational research. The idea of a schema in which new information fits into a pre-existing schema, that is a way of thinking about something, or accommodation in which that information completely reevaluates or reforms the schema to a whole new extent to account for this new information or way of doing something. We also inherit from Piaget the idea of stages of development. These are biologically ordained categories for Piaget that just happen. And I recommend Alex Moore's superb accessible chapter on all of these three thinkers that we're about to revisit here. So for Piaget, these sort of just happen. There's the sensory motor stage in a child's birth, then there's the pre-operational and concrete operational stages sometime after that in infancy. The formal operational stage is where we learn to access higher order thinking. And from this, we learn that it's good to practice teaching, which moves from the concrete to the abstract, as teaching often does, in fact. Next, we have Vygotsky. Let's call him Lev for now. He was born in Tsarist Russia and is another fascinating figure in the history of social constructivist theory. Amongst his best known idea is the idea of the zone of proximal development or ZPD for short. It basically refers to the idea of what we can do with assisted learning from what Vygotsky calls the more learned other. This doesn't necessarily have to be 
a teacher, an older teacher, it can be a younger peer who's more experienced in the thing that they're teaching. With this guided assistance from the more learned other, we can have permanent increases in thinking and doing, say, archery or mathematics or learning how to write essays. There is a framework or scaffold, if you will, for learning. Vygotsky is worth paying attention to since for most of the 20th century, his work was unavailable, untranslated into English. And the key idea or key takeaway of Vygotsky is that the interpsychological, the social, becomes the intrapsychological, the permanent increase in human abilities. This is just a brief side note for all the fans out there. But Vygotsky's ideas about the social aspects of learning can be connected with Marx's ideas about human perfectibility. However, Vygotsky's ideas in the history of the Soviet Union were sidelined. It's worth noting that Stalin was reputed to favor behaviorism overall, and Vygotsky's afterlife was by no means guaranteed. Finally, we have Jerome Bruner. Sorry, yes, another man but also another towering figure in the history of social constructivist thinking about education. His best known ideas are instructional scaffolding, which he takes and develops from Vygotsky, and the idea of spiral curriculum, in which the learner revisits the same idea in an altogether more complex way than they did perhaps a few months ago. He is an advocate for guided discovery through structures of support, so things like doing experiments, and having demonstrations with the teacher in a Q&A scaffolded format. The pupil will solve problems, but the teacher can intervene if they get stuck. A cognitive psychologist or psychologist by training, he made his name with works like Towards a Theory of Instruction, which looked at instructional settings in abstraction from other wider social contexts like poverty or culture. This was a position he was later to move away from when in the 90s he concentrating on these things like poverty and culture with works like culture and education. Again, I recommend the accessible quick chapter from Alex Moore from 2012 on all of these three figures, if you're interested, which you should be. Anyway, thank you for your time. See you in the next video.